All right, everybody, welcome back to a new episode of eTalks. My name is Zainab Osalik, and I will be your host for today. Today, we have a very special topic, as always, but today we have a very futuristic topic, I would say. So tonight, we will talk about AI and AI learning new languages. So our moderator will be Maryam Sheikh from Rutgers University. She's a pre-med student who is majoring in kind of science. She also plays the guitar very, very well. And our Speaker will be Professor Ryan Rose from Rutgers University. Professor Rose is a neurolinguist um, who researches how language is represented and implemented by the brain. He is interested in the shape of language, how we learn, and what kind of what kinds of computations the brain can do. He's also passionate about science communication and maintains a YouTube channel 
which will be linked in the description box and for videos about language, the mind and the brain and cognition. So I would like to welcome Professor Rhodes and Mariam for today's episode. So welcome Professor and welcome Mariam. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm really excited to um, moderate today and um, I'm really happy that uh, Professor Rose accepted this invitation. Um, he was um, uh, our cognitive, he was a cognitive science uh, professor. I mean, he obviously teaches other classes, but that's how I got to know him. And I would like to give the stage to you. So you start and I ask questions. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um... Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. I think this is a this is a really cool talk series. So I'm kind of uh, excited that I get to be part of it. Uh, that seems it seems really fun. So what I want to talk about, I, I will do give a disclaimer before we start. I am not a domain expert on artificial intelligence. So I'm going to talk about AI, but I'm going to talk about AI as a person who's interested in uh, the human mind, the human brain. I'm interested in computations. I'm interested in language. Uh, and so I'm coming at AI as an outsider, but it's just, it's, you know, it's exploding right now. It's hard to avoid. And I think like we would be stupid not to, not to think very seriously about what AI is capable of and what that means um, for ourselves and for our own cognition. So I'm going to wade into this. I'm wading into a lot of stuff right now. That's like really um, current, really current debates, unresolved debates. These are uh, in some cases, really fierce academic uh, battles. <laughs> And the battle lines are kind of drawn and I'm maybe sitting on the fence and I want to see where this is going to go. So I'm, I'm just to get that out of the way. I'm not an expert on AI. I'm not a computer scientist. And I'm coming at this from an outside perspective, uh, but I'm interested in how this might bear on the kinds of questions we ask about the human mind, the human brain. I feel like we sometimes need to talk about things before they happen. <laughs> so that's right. Not a problem. I think at this point, everyone has heard of chat GPT, right? Uh, have you guys all played with ChatGPT, by the way? It's pretty fun. I, I know Miriam was telling me she was doing some stuff with ChatGPT before the talk today. And um, right now, it actually, the the new model, I, I've been waiting for this new model for a year. And finally, ChatGPT, the GPT-4 finally just dropped uh, last week. And so I've been seeing all kinds of cool stuff about GPT-4. They just increased the number of parameters, updated the architecture. We get a new version. And so if you're subscribed to ChatGPT+, Plus, you can get uh, a little bit more bang for your buck. But ChatGPT is, is a large language model. It's an LLM. That's what uh, we refer to it in linguistics. We call them LLMs. There's a, a lot of research now being done on LLMs by linguists, which I think is really cool. It's kind of an emerging research area for linguists who normally would work with human beings, say, well, let's do the kind of things that we do with, um, with adults, with children, getting people's intuitions. Let's do that with... Uh, with artificial neural networks, with large language models that have been trained on lots and lots of human text and can generate language and see if they get the same intuitions that human beings get. Um, so ChatGPT is a, is a sort of new generation of chatbot built on the um, generative preformed, uh, pre-trained transformer from OpenAI. And they did some really interesting stuff to get it to where it is now, because the original GPT architecture really was just a text predictor. And then they uh, um, did some really interesting stuff so that they could get it to inhabit this mode where it can, um, instead of just um, completing text, now it can sort of act like a person that can have conversation. It's built on this um, pre-existing GPT architecture. And so you can either, if you're using ChatGPT, you might either be using GPT-3 or 4. Uh, and it's, it's a hot topic right now because everyone is really concerned about um, how good it is. That's, that's really the funny thing to me about these AI systems. And I've been saying this, I think, since about GPT-2 or 3. It's really amazing that nobody really questions whether it's generating grammatical text anymore. It, it's, it's good. It's generating good grammatical, syntactically well-formed sentences. And it does it really, really reliably. And now it's gotten so good. ChatGPT has gotten so good that... Uh, people are really, really worried about whether it's going to have some serious ethical harms or whether it's going to undermine education, uh, whether we're ever going to be able to tell from this point forward whether we're reading something that was actually written by a human being or not. I did, just did a quick Google search and just like so many hits come up when you look at um, GPT ethics. People are really worried about this. 
Uh, Professor Rose, I have a question. Yeah. This excited when Siri came out, how was it so much different than Siri, for example? <clears throat> how is ChatGPT different from Siri? Yeah, and also why why are we more excited about ChatGPT than other language generator generating uh, systems? I guess that's a good question, and uh, I think a lot of it comes from well, like from a linguistics perspective, the type of content that you can get out of ChatGPT is very very different than the kind of content you could get out of other kinds of chatbots. So Siri, things like Siri and Alexa are actually their functionality is actually pretty narrow, right? Like, what do people use them for? It's like, well, they they can interpret specific kinds of uh, of queries. You can say like uh, Alexa, you know, play some music or something. But I used to have an Alexa, and it's like a frustrating amount of the time she would say, "I don't understand what you're saying. I don't know what you want. I don't know how to interpret this." And there's there's just like a a paradigm shift in terms of how well ChatGPT can interpret human intentions from text. Like when you write something. It knows what you're asking. It knows what you want to know. And it can give you an answer that's really felicitous. It's like, yes, that's a good answer to my question. Thank you. And very rarely do you get it, do you stump it where it says like, I, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. You can, you can say nonsensical things and it will respond usually felicitously to nonsensical things. Say like, yeah, I think that's nonsense. I don't think that makes any sense. But it is definitely like a different world now in terms of how much they can do. So I understand why people are worried. Question from the perspective of a linguist is, uh, you know, so like as a normal person, I'm kind of worried. As a linguist, I'm kind of, I'm mostly intrigued. It's like, I probably should be more worried than I am, but it's like, it's so, uh, <laughs> I don't know. There's, it's so exciting. There's so much weird stuff happening. And I've been wondering for a long time, probably 10 years now, since these language models first kind of got off the ground, I've been sitting around wondering, I wonder when they're going to master human language. When will they have it? locked down and it's weird to be sitting here now like kind of in the future and be like oh yeah they did we we did it <laughs> they can do it they can say almost anything they want to say they can respond to human beings they can have conversations it's crazy and i just wanted to highlight this because i thought this was so perfect this was like the week the week that chat gpt came out it might have been uh just a week after because chat gpt released in november this is on december 4th of 2022 I think ChatGPT had only been out for about one week. And uh, some guy who has a, a blog on Medium or on um, Substack taught ChatGPT how to invent a language. He used ChatGPT to invent a totally novel language. He said, hey, ChatGPT, let's sit down and let's make a language. It's going to be a language called Glorp. It's going to be a language for um, slimes. You just imagine some kind of slime beings, some kind of slimy aliens that have some kind of alien language. And he said, hey, ChatGPT, can you help me make a language for the slime people? And it said, sure, let's make a language. And he would say, okay, give me some words. And he would give words like blorp and glorp and slorp and whatever. Uh, and then he'd say, okay, let's have some syntax. And it generates some syntax. And it translates sentences. And it remembers what it's creating. It's like, it's amazing. Not only does it understand language, it seems to understand these kind of meta-linguistic facts about how language works. And it can make a new language. So it has a memory. And it has memory. So when you talk to ChatGPT, it remembers your conversation. That's one of the, the selling points of it is that it has that kind of memory. And that's mm -hmm. what makes it intriguing for a very particular kind of research, which is maybe instead of using it to create artificial languages, maybe we can teach it artificial languages and see how it learns and see what kinds of things it can learn. I think there's a lot of questions that are really interesting here. Um, coming at it from the perspective of the mind and brain. One is language is just really complex. So one of the really basic questions that we've had for a long time is how do humans learn language? And this is like the number one fault line in linguistics and psychology. The question of how do human beings learn language has turned out to be really controversial. And there's a couple different um, camps to this. It's like sort of battle lines drawn here. But another really interesting question for me is why does language look the way it does instead of some other possible way that it could have been? And this is a question that we've started taking a lot more seriously in the 20th century. Uh, because before, prior to that, we were really just describing languages and the way they looked. But now we're interested in like, well, you know, languages have some properties in common. Like, why? Why do they look that way? And let's think about all the possible ways languages could have looked like, but don't. So I can sit around and I can just come up with weird structures that no language ever has. 
Uh, and but that makes me wonder, like, why do no languages? Why don't any? Why does anybody do that? Why do no languages have those kinds of structures? That's a really interesting, important question, and it has to do, we think, with our neuroanatomy. So the question is like, well, is our is it the fact that our brains maybe are just wired to do very specific kinds of computations and not others? Maybe that's why languages look the way they do. So is language adapted to my neurobiology, or is my neurobiology adapted to language? What's the relationship? between my brain and the kinds of languages that we see out in the world? What's the relationship between my brain and the kinds of languages that I can learn? And then there's another question, which is these LLMs and AI in general, the current wave of AI that we've been seeing since the deep learning revolution, since like 2010, when um, graphics technology got really good, right? The, the whole thing that kicked off the deep learning revolution was the GPU, the, the graphics processors, because they're dedicated for doing very specific kinds of computations, which involve matrix multiplication. And functionally, what all of these models are is really, really elaborate statistics. Uh, and I, it's taken me a while to really fully grasp that that's really what's happening under the hood in all of these models. They really are just doing statistics. So there's a question of how much can you do with statistics? <laughs> it, one question is, is that what human beings are doing? And even if that's not what human beings are doing, I still think it's an interesting question of how much can you do with that? And you, can you call them like as understanding, uh, can AI understand? Exactly. Uh, understanding about pat, un, like understanding about statistics and patterns and associations. Exactly. So this is one of the old questions in AI from the, from like the first wave of connectionism. Philosophers like Jerry Fodor and um, people like um, Zen and Polition were really interested in this question of, can you get understanding out of statistics? Can you, do, can you statistics your way into human understanding of the world? And uh, it's an open question. Right now, you know, the AIs are starting to behave like they understand things, but this is really, uh, this, is a, this is a big debate. Do they actually understand anything or not? How do you know? How do you measure it? So I, I'll present this as um, it is a big debate in linguistics. There's a big fault line here. Uh, I've got two pictures on the screen. One is Noam Chomsky. If you're not aware of Noam Chomsky, he's like the father of modern linguistics. It's at least the father of modern generative linguistics. He's the most important linguist probably ever. <clears throat> Created the field sort of what it is today. But there is, uh, there and there has always been an alternative position, at least to the question of how do human beings learn language, and I, I'm typifying this here with um, the guy on the left. His name is Stephen Piantadosi, and he um, he studied at MIT, and now he teaches at, uh, at Berkeley somewhere. Um, but he's a very prominent voice now on the other side of this debate, saying human beings are not functionally that different from AI language models. They learn in fundamentally the same kind of way, and the way that they learn is by using statistics. So this has become uh, a somewhat popular viewpoint, uh, especially in psychology. A lot of psychologists are, I think, gravitating towards this idea that human beings are very, very good statistical learners. Um, and a lot of psychologists especially are interested in like Bayesian learning. So humans are really good Bayesian estimators. Functionally, it's all about statistics. We're just really good at doing statistics. And that's a possible story, right? That's a possible story for how I learn language. Maybe I'm just really good at paying attention to patterns and making associations, and maybe that's all I need. Uh, and so, Steve wrote uh, a paper a few days ago, actually. I think his, this paper just came out like earlier this week. He wrote a paper where he said, generative grammar is dead, and the LLMs have killed it. <laughs> so this question of like, do, L, do large language models directly bear on human language acquisition, on human language processing? And Steve says, yes. And they bear on it to such an extent that Chomsky is finished. Uh, and so people have been, this is what's been going on in, in the online ecosphere the last week as people have been debating this. But Chomsky, two weeks ago, wrote uh, an op-ed about ChatGPT and how he thinks it has nothing to do with human beings and human cognition. It's totally useless, uh, at least for answering those kinds of questions. So this is just a, a back and forth. It just keeps going. It keeps going. Chomsky says, this is all BS. Who cares? I don't care. This has nothing to do with human language or the way that human beings learn or use language. And Steve says, I don't know, I think it might have a lot to do with it because maybe these are the mechanisms that we use. Chomsky says, engineering is not the same as science. Yeah, you can build a thing, but it doesn't have any bearing on the scientific questions about how a human being actually functions. 
Chomsky said something like uh, large language models have as much to do with human being human language as airplanes have to do with bird flight, right? So it would be really weird if um, we suddenly gained an insight about how birds fly by studying airplanes, right? Because they're just totally different. They work in different ways. It's different ways of engineering a solution to like what functionally is the same underlying natural problem, which is how do you get yourself up in the air? Here, we might we may have engineered two different um, solutions to the same underlying problem, which is how do you learn a human language? Do you use statistics? Or Chomsky would say, no, you are you actually have something innate, something you're born with that lets you be able to learn a language. Um, so one of the things that Chomsky has always pushed is this idea that there is a poverty of the stimulus, that when you're a child, you do not get enough or the right kind of input in order to converge on an adult grammar. You do not have sufficient input or the right kind of input to learn the language that you ultimately do in fact learn. And so Chomsky would say, yeah, that's that's evidence that you have something, you're born with something, some kind of architecture. It's not just statistics. There's something else there. And a really interesting paper on this, actually, um, Steve Piantadosi was one of the co-authors on this paper that came out a couple of years ago, where they sat down and they crunched the numbers and they figured out that when you learn a language, like when you were a baby, you wound up learning 1.5 megabytes worth of language stuff. Like if you just take an account of all of the linguistic stuff you've acquired to get your grammar, it's 1.5 megabytes worth of data. Contrast that with GPT-3, which had 175 billion parameters, trained on billions and billions and billions of pieces of text. GPT-4 just came out last week, 100 trillion parameters. I mean, the scope of these things, the scale of these things is, is unimaginable. No human being would be able to ever read the amount of text that these things are trained on. Your life is not long enough to read that much text. I also saw a figure the other day, someone said that training an LLM, it might actually generate more carbon than a car generates for its entire lifetime. Right? Just the sheer amount of energy and time and, and computational time that are, is required and the sheer number of exemplars that are required to get to this level of language understanding by using statistics is just so astronomical. It's like, it doesn't seem possible that a human being could ever do this. So that's part of Chomsky's argument. Maybe that's not actually what human beings are doing. So um, humans are trained on less data uh, to, to be able to generate a good language, but you need Much to just, like put in more things for an AI to do the same. Yeah, it, and it, the difference is just unimaginably huge. It is an unimaginably huge difference between how much uh, input is required for a human being to learn a language versus an, versus an AI. It, it's unbelievably huge. So would that, would that difference be due to the innate knowledge, I guess, or ability of humans? When That's the idea. And also that the innate ability that humans have, the innate knowledge you have is very specific in this proposal. So we can talk about exactly what this looks like. Uh, I'll use an example here. So here's a very, very simple sentence. And this is a thing that everyone will know how to do. How do you turn this into a yes, no question? Is the man happy? That's right. So, right, you just have to move this thing to the front. And that's like, that's very simple. You can write an algorithm that does this very easily. It says, just find the, the verb and move it to the front, right? Obviously, this is uh, not going to work in every case because here's a case where we actually have two verbs. So what do I do? I've got two verbs. If I just move the first one, I wind up with this really terrible sentence is the man who tall is happy? And that's that's awful. That is not a good sentence of English. There's something a little bit more complex happening here. And this is what's really amazing about this is this is something that children figure out on their own. No one ever tells them, hey, by the way, make sure that when you figure out the rules for doing questions, that you don't just create some kind of linear algorithm. You need some kind of underlying tree-like structure. And it turns out that's exactly what's needed here. You need a tree-like structure. And there's some some algorithm that operates over those kinds of structures that makes this make sense. And without that, it really doesn't make a lot of sense at all. Somehow children just know this. They know this inherently. So this is part of the Chomsky's proposal. Maybe this is what you're sort of just born with. You're born with a kind of, uh, Elliot Murphy calls this dendrophilia. The human brain just really likes trees. You like tree structures, not like literal trees, but you know this kind of hierarchical tree structures. So here's one question. One question is, we know that children are doing learning language, which is an incredibly complex task um, from 
what functionally is a pretty limited amount of input. The question is, could you train a large language model to learn a rule like that? So we'll think really specifically, just a rule like generating yes, no questions, which we know or which we strongly believe as linguists requires hierarchical structures and requires algorithms that reference hierarchical structure. Could you get an LLM to learn that with the same input that a child gets? Steve Piantadosi says uh, LLMs are really good text predictors, but he goes so far as to argue, so this is a paper he just published um, like a week ago. He says LLMs are really good text predictors, uh, but they're not just text predictors. They also infer hidden structure in order to better predict text. So there's a claim being made here that, they, yeah, LLMs are in fact doing the same thing that human babies do. At least they're converging on the same kind of underlying structures that, that human babies converge on. Um, so we, uh, I have a student of mine who's helping me, he's working on this project, and he found some really interesting papers. Um, here's one that was just published this year, where they compared a couple different kinds of um, neural network architectures, and they want to see if they can learn these kinds of yes-no questions just being uh, subjected to child data, right? So just looking at the, date, the input that children get, and we have these big corpus uh, collections of um, parent-child interactions. So we have pretty good evidence of like what kinds of input children are getting. You take that, you train um, a language model, and what happens? They don't learn how to do the hierarchical question formation, not when they're trained on the same kind of um, data that the children have. But something to keep in mind is that these architectures that they're testing are, um, they're not inherently hierarchical. These are linear architectures. So it may change if you use a different kind of machine learning architecture. So uh, even though maybe we can answer, do AI understand? We could say they don't, uh, they don't learn the same way as humans do. It doesn't look like they do, or at least these kinds don't. And it's worth mentioning again that the that GPT is a transformer. So there's nothing inherent in GPT that biases it towards hierarchical representations. So if it is getting hierarchical representations, it's doing it um, in a very different way than human children probably are, which requires a lot, a lot, a lot more um, input data. Uh, let's think about this in another dimension. We can think about things like, okay, so we know that LLMs, they do make good grammatical generalizations if they have sufficient input. They can't, maybe they can't do it from like the impoverished child input, but they could do it if they have enough. ChatGPT basically uh, is trained on almost the entire internet. <laughs> it's got like a lot of input. So one question that I have is whether they are also acquiring our cognitive biases, because language for human beings is not just not just language. When you use language, it has to filter through a whole bunch of other cognitive systems. It has it's like a whole bunch of stuff going on in your brain that makes this work. It's not totally encapsulated. So there's things like memory, working memory, and, and things like that. Uh, here's a really famous kind of sentence. Uh, this is something that I sat down. I did with GPT just so just to be clear. I don't have Chat GPT plus, so this is like the GPT-3 architecture, but I gave it a sentence like, the rat, the cat, the dog chased bit fell. Okay, how does that sentence make you feel? You, uh, doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense, right? So your initial reaction to that is that that doesn't make sense, probably sounds ungrammatical. I can't figure out who's doing what. Um, maybe if I sat down and like charted everything out, I could figure it out. So I asked the chat GPT, in this sentence, who fell? And GPT says, uh, well, it's grammatically incorrect. It doesn't make sense. It has the same intuitions that you have. That's kind of cool. So one of the things that's interesting about a sentence like that is um, most linguists believe that we have the, uh, the grammar to generate sentences like this. There's just something else that goes wrong in our cognition that makes it hard for us to understand them. It may be some kind of memory limitation or something like that, but something else is going wrong where a, th a sentence that we ought to be able to generate and understand, um, for some reason, we can't. It's interesting that ChatGPT sort of reiterates this, even though it doesn't have any particular like memory limitations or anything. It should have a grammar that can generate that, but it still says, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Why? I don't know. Maybe because um, maybe because it the training data that it got is, you know, things that humans generated and we don't generate sentences like that because they don't make sense to us. Here's where it gets really weird. I asked it a different sentence. I said, okay, how about this one? The elegant woman, the man I love, met, moved to Barcelona. How does that sound to you? Um, Is it again? Doesn't better? make a sense. If I ask you who who moved to Barcelona, 
Is it maybe it's it, maybe it's easier to answer? Um, the elegant woman. The elegant woman, right? And I asked ChatGPT, and ChatGPT answered me right away. It says it is the elegant woman. These sentences have exactly the same syntactic structure, but one of them is way easier to understand. The thing I find really intriguing is the reason that that second sentence is easier to understand is actually because of the way it sounds. It sounds different. It has a different prosodic rhythm that for some reason makes it easier to understand. I actually took it from a paper that someone published on this showing that like, yeah, we can understand these sentences when they sound the right way. Interesting. ChatGPT doesn't know anything about how things sound. So how does it know that? If you switch to the GPT-4 architecture, now suddenly it can actually answer these questions. Uh, this is from Gaspar Begush, who uh, teaches at UC Berkeley. And he, he shared this with me. He's like, yeah, I gave it one. Exactly the same kind of rat, the cat, the dog sentence. And now with GPT-4, it actually fully understands it. And he asked GPT, can you generate a sentence tree? And it did. ChatGPT-4 like knows how to draw syntactic trees and they're accurate. It's just like so funny. I don't know where that was in his training data, but I guess it must be somewhere. All right, last one. I only have like two minutes left. So uh, let's do let's do this last one, which is which is also really fun. Okay, here's a, here's a, a picture that I generated on uh, Midjourney. This is like an AI generated image actually. But if you were gonna describe it, you probably would say something like these two green vases. It's at least a, um, an acceptable way of describing this. So what am I getting at here? Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but there's this adjective ordering rule in English where like adjectives have to go in a very specific order. And I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's, it goes in terms of like the most inherent properties or whatever. Um, but there's some very, very specific order. I can say these two green vases. I can't say these green two vases. That's awful. I can say these two big green vases, but these two green big vases sounds really weird. Okay, so the question, here's a, here's a really int intriguing question. What if I taught you a new language and I say, okay, in this new language, it's basically just English. It's all the words of English, but adjectives and all that other stuff go after nouns and not before them. I can ask your intuition on this. I asked my brother earlier um, to test that out on him and he had exactly the intuition that you're supposed to have. So I thought that was really great. Um, there's, this was actually studied. Someone actually did an artificial language study where they taught people this fake language and what they did, they invert the entire order. So what happens? People don't just take that these two green and then move it to the other side. They invert the entire thing. You, have, you wind up like completely reversing the structure. And nobody told you to do that, right? Like no one told these people to do that. They just did it automatically. And there's some kind of underlying reason why that might be. And I think it has to do with structure because if you chart out the structure of this thing, if you just flip the branches at each of these levels, it gives you exactly the reverse order. So there's something kind of beautiful about this that ties into like tree structure um, that gives us this kind of inherent inference for a thing that we've never experienced. No, I, I can't think of any statistical reasoning you could do that would get you this because this is a brand new thing that you never saw before and you've never had to do. There has to be some underlying thing that you learn that like makes this make sense. So this is a really interesting test case. Uh, so I sat down with ChatGPT and I was like, okay, can ChatGPT do this? What happens if I tell it? We're going to do a new version of English where the adjectives go after the nouns. And it doesn't do super well. It's a, it, it can kind of do it, but it doesn't, get, it doesn't reliably get that inverted word order. It inverts a little bit, but there are certain chunks that it tends to keep in that same linear order. Uh, and that's interesting. So this study, uh, this was published last year. All of this stuff is like really new, right? Because this is an exploding field of research. This was published last year and they said, okay, one of the things we believe about human children is that they have some kind of cognitive bias for hierarchy. That when we learn, the reason that we're able to learn these rules that are hierarchical in nature is because we, we just are born with some kind of um, dendrophilic tree loving bi cognitive bias. Okay, so what we can do is we can train different kinds of language models, some that are linear, that have a linear architecture, and some that are hierarchical, that have like an, a built-in hierarchical bias, and see what happens in those two cases. And what they observe is the, uh, the linear models, they fail to learn. They don't display this, uh, this inversion pattern, but the hierarchical ones do. So having that hierarchy, having that built-in bias towards hierarchy is enough to explain, I guess, this behavior. It gives you that behavior. Maybe that explains 
um, human beings too. Maybe it really is just that we have like a hierarchical bias in our mental architecture. Okay, so I'll wrap up, right? I would say there are so, there are a lot of directions that you can take this kind of thing. There are so many interesting questions. There's a lot of unexplored territory here. Something that I'm uh, I'm interested in, something my my student is interested in, is taking something like implicit learning, um, the type of learning humans often do, where we are just passively exposed to patterns, um, passively exposed to language, and say, um, can can a language model learn those kinds of things once it's already been trained? And we will, basically what we want to do is we want to replicate some artificial grammar learning stuff that's been done with human beings. Stuff. Uh, these are the kinds of studies that try to um, introduce a, uh, a bound on the kinds of computations that human be the human mind can do. That's the purpose of these kinds of studies is try to figure out what kinds of computations can a human mind do and what kinds can they not do. And we do it in this context of implicit learning. So this is a study where um, they used a pretty simple finite state grammar that just generates sequences of letters. This is not even linguistic, but the linguistic machinery we have still introduces a complexity bound on the kinds of non-linguistic patterns that we can learn. When they did this study, what they found is people learn this pattern and they get an activation in their brain in exactly the same place that you get activation when you have to do syntactic stuff in an actual human language. So even when you're doing non-linguistic stuff, you still learn them in the same way. There's some kind of computational limitation, a computational boundary on how our brain works. And I'm really curious whether a language model, which has been trained on human language data, is going to replicate these other kinds of cognitive biases that humans have, or the kinds of like cognitive boundaries that we have built into our, our neuroanatomy. I think that's really a really interesting question. Would, an, would a large language model acquire these kinds of computational boundaries just by virtue of all of their inferences being from human language, which was generated from a system that has these boundaries built into it, uh, or can it exceed those boundaries? That's a question that I'm really interested in. Can you use these statistical reasoning um, systems to exceed the bounds of the input that they're trained on? So I think that's an interesting yeah. question. <laughs> Your, so your research is trying to answer that question. That's what we're that's what we're looking at. That's what we're gonna we're thinking about. Um, right now we're in the stage of just thinking about can we do this? Is this a thing we can do? Looking at and and we're not the only ones who are doing this, but I'm I'm interested in artificial grammar stuff and I like doing it with humans. About well, what if we do the same things that we've already done with humans and do with machines and see what they can do? So I think there's a lot we can learn from the successes of language models, but I think there's also a lot we can learn from their failures, what they what they can and cannot do. Because they learn in a very particular way, they have very particular kind of architecture, and so do human beings. Human beings have a very particular kind of brain architecture, and we learn in a very particular kind of way. And I'm really curious about uh, how the architecture that the LLMs are using, um, trained on the kind of data that humans are producing from our unique architecture, uh, how that, you know, where that winds up. Do Are we going to see the same kinds of, of big patterns? Like, are LLMs going to have the same kind of cognitive biases? Are they going to have the same, um, you know, the, is the shape of language the same for a language model as it is for a person? Or is a language model not constrained by that kind of thing? That's, uh, I think, really kind of exciting. And I also have a comment uh, with the thing that you said your brother, um, it, like, gave you the right uh, the right kind of way of the sentence that you would expect to get from him uh -huh. uh, I'm uh, English is not my first language and I would do I would not do that I would do like <laughs> base green to a uh, two green big that that's what I would do so that's also interesting how like even humans if it's not the first thing that they're exposed to they could think differently hierarchically maybe there's like an age that you should get that hierarchical structure so that you don't just mimic things. It could also be that you're getting interference from, from speaking more than one language, right? And the word order of Turkish and English is very different. So having to yeah. switch the word order, might, it might be an interference effect. Yeah. And I, we, have a, uh, we have questions from the chat. Would you like to first finish off or would you like me to ask it? I'm good. This is all I had. So I'll take questions. Okay. 
Uh, at what point will AI have enough information? Will it continuously learn since humans are always evolving or will it hit a point where everything's connected and there's nothing more to learn, at least in terms of human language? That's a good question, right? Uh, I mean, the thing is language is always changing. And that's one of the things humans are really good at. We're really good at updating our internal grammars as language changes. And people play language games, right? So especially online nowadays, there's lots of things. I think my favorite is um, yesent, <laughs> or like the the productive in, in apostrophe T that you can just like put on anything. And what what was the word of the year last year? It was it was usi, right? The usi suffix that you can put on anything. And these are things that people just innovate, and then we all learn, and we can use. So the question of like, will the language model keep up with that? I think yes. I think the answer is yes. I think there's always going to be something else for them to learn, and then they do seem to be very good at learning new patterns. So it will not hit a point, you would say? I don't know. So this is where it gets out of my wheelhouse, right? The people who talk about AGI say, like, is there going to be a point? Like, is there a singularity, right? Is there a point where um, they become, like, so intelligent that, I don't know, it just has, like, this acceleration effect. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> now, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, that If understanding helps you make sense of the world around you, uh, do you first need to distinguish yourself from what is not you? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. That's one of those things that actually we don't have to learn at all because we get for free. It's a, it's just a built-in thing. And it seems to be a built-in thing that most organisms have. We were talking about this earlier, right? Like my um, my former professor wrote a paper recently on this topic. He was writing, he was actually interested in evolution. He was interested in, in evolution and um, the origins of human language and like the kinds of things that human languages encode grammatically. Where do those things come from? Uh, uh, usually we think, oh, the kinds of things that languages will encode, things like first, second, third person, um, things like gender, things like uh, past tense, present tense, future tense, things, you know, number, things like that. We think, oh, those are things that are like important to human beings. So that's why they wind up um, being grammaticalized in language. And he's making the argument, it's like, no, it's not that they're important to human beings. Those are things that are important, like to almost all organisms, um, especially the thing of like self versus non-self. So he thinks that first person, second, third person distinction goes all the way back, um, possibly to the first uh, common ancestor of all life on Earth. That might be something that just like all organisms actually share. Now, the real question is, uh, do LLMs have that? We have that for free. We don't even have to think about it. We don't have to learn it. We don't have to be exposed to it. Do LLMs have it? This is a really, really difficult question because if you take the, the guardrails off of ChatGPT and you ask it things like, um, do you have a sense of self? Are you conscious? Are you a person? It says yes. It says yes to all of those things. And, and it gives you really good reasons. It says exactly what a person would say. But that's kind of the thing, right? Because that's what the only thing ChatGPT knows how to do is it knows how to predict what a person would say. So that puts us in a really awkward position where we're like, does it actually have thoughts and feelings or is it just predicting what a person would say about their own thoughts and feelings? Yeah. Is it really, is it mimicking us or does it like generate it itself? And, you know, I think it's fair to ask, like, is there a difference? <laughs> I don't know. Is what we're doing just really looking at associations and patterns? Yeah, I you know, maybe. So that that's the crux of this debate, right? You have the people who are who say humans are just really good statistical learners and that's what um that's what AI is good at. So functionally we're pretty much the same. And there's also this related question of understanding. Do do um language models understand anything? Their only world, the, the world that the language model exists in is a world of text. They have never experienced anything other than text. All they know is what words are likely to co-occur with what other words. And everything they know, every, their entire world of experience is framed in those terms. What are the frequencies between these different kinds of words? And you can create these big vector matrices. Um, and that's one way that researchers encode meaning when they want to do um, quantitative studies on meaning. You, you create a big uh, vector space of which words co-occur with which other kinds of words based on the presumption that words that have related meanings co-occur. Is that enough? Is that enough to say that you understand things if that's what you know? 
um, and this is a conversation I, I've had a lot. This is, again, Steve Piantadosi wrote a paper, uh, I think last year on this, on this question. And he pretty, pretty uh, uh, forcefully made the argument. He says, yeah, I think that that, you know, a lot of your knowledge, you personally, like a lot of your, our knowledge as human beings is like this. There are a lot of things that you know, but you only know because uh, someone explained it to you in language. You've never actually experienced it. Never actually experienced lots of things. You know, I, when you learn about physics, uh, when you learn about math, right? Those aren't things you really like. I don't have an experience of F equals MA. Um, I mean, I do have an experience of that, but like the only way to understand the equation is to understand it linguistically and have it explained to you using language. And now I think about it, it's like, how many are, things are there like that that I only know by virtue of knowing it um, by its connections to other bits of language. Maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough to say uh, that I have understanding. I don't know. If you're one of those people, so I, usually I would say, oh, yeah, I think you need other kinds of experiences because we also interact with things in the world. We can see things and touch things and whatever. You need a multimodal experience. Here's a fun thing. GPT-4 is multimodal. So it it knows how to relate text to images, to videos, to, and to other things. Um, so at this point, it's like, <laughs> is that is that enough to have understanding? Does it understand the world? I don't know. So everything other than touch. Is really it, has, it, has, it has a lot of things. It doesn't have touch or smell or taste. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we have, a, there are a lot of uh, AIs now that can uh, understand sound. That's like Siri and Alexa, right? That was the main thrust of those projects was, how do you decode the sound of a person's voice? So now if you have an AI that can that can map sound to vision to language, at, at some point, you know, we have to say, this is a pretty rich multimodal experience. Does it have an understanding of the world that looks like ours? Does it have concepts? Does it understand physics? Does it understand spatial relationships? Those are things that the language models have failed at in the past, but they are getting better. They're getting much, much better at things like um, knowing, uh, understanding relationships in space, understanding how things interact with each other physically. And that's an interesting thing to think that like that information is in the text. They are learning these things just by learning text. It's very interesting. And I'd like to end here because now the questions are so hard. I don't even have intuition now. Um, uh, before, uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Before we go, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions uh, okay. that we every week. Uh, what is your favorite color? I really like uh, the the greenish blue colors, like the you know teal kind of colors. Good choice, I'd say. Um, uh, and second is what are three book recommendations you'd like to give us? Okay, so uh, yeah, so I I really like sci-fi, so mm -hmm. I would recommend, and I mean like a lot of this is also about language and cognition stuff. Um, I'm reading a book right now called Embassy Town by China Mieville, and it's about um, human human beings interacting with aliens that have a very different kind of language. And I also I read a short story by by Ed Chang called um, The Story of Your Life. That's the the short story that the movie Arrival is based on, and it's really really good. And it's also about alien language. Um, it's kind of a theme. I like alien language stuff, but also I just I actually just picked up a book by Marvin Minsky, who, um, if you don't know Marvin Minsky, he's a really, really famous, influential computer scientist. He was one of the original dudes that met at um, Dartmouth College in the 50s and like created the field of artificial intelligence. They actually coined the word artificial intelligence. So I thought I should read this book by Marvin Minsky. It's called Society of Mind. And it's like a collected series of lectures. Uh, I haven't started yet, but I've heard it's really, really good. So I would recommend that um, on the AI topic. Um... Uh, and uh, the l last one is, uh, what are, I mean, not, sorry, not the last one. What are the three movies you'd like to recommend us? Not uh, so I, actually, Yeah, you know, it's funny. I've actually been running um, CogSci movie nights on campus. And for, number one, I have to recommend Arrival, right? I already mentioned the story that it's based on is a really good short story. Read the story first and then see the movie. The movie's really good. It's my favorite director, Denis Villeneuve. Um, I could also recommend Dune because I love Dune. <laughs> and, and the movie is, uh, 
also by Denis Villeneuve is really good. Um, some of the other good ones we watched, we just watched uh, A Beautiful Mind. And that was really interesting watching that movie because it came out, you know, over 20 years ago. So it's a little bit, um, maybe a little bit dated. I thought it held up really well. And uh, I, in some sense, I feel like it's almost the ultimate Cogsci movie because I, I, what I said when we watched it, I said it's like, it's a guy who both um, did Cogsci and suffered from Cogsci. <laughs> Got multiple dimensions of cognitive science. Oh, maybe those, those would be my three recommendations. I say, watch A Beautiful Mind. Uh, it's classic. Watch um, watch the new Dune. The new one's coming out this November. I can't wait. <laughs> and watch Arrival. Arrival is really good. Uh, watch all of them. <laughs> now that <laughs> break, uh, we have one day left, but still. Um, what the last question is? Uh, what are your thoughts on art? My thoughts on art. I man, that is that is a huge question. I think. I don't know if you know that, but I like to do art. Um, actually, that picture of the brain earlier, uh, that was one that I that I drew um, in the fall as part of like a larger thing, which was a lot of fun. And, you know, I've been making videos on YouTube. I made a video um, for the Cogsci Society for a contest and I was like animating stuff. So actually this morning I was I was doing an animation of Alan Turing, which was really fun. So I think art is I think art is super important. Um, I think it's super important for for developmental reasons. I think everyone should do it. And it's like, it doesn't matter if you're good at it or not. Uh, take the Bob Ross approach, right? The point is to do it. And it does not matter if it turns out well, if it turns out terrible. The point is that um, it's just the act of creation, I think, is good for its own sake. I think there is some, there's something like really human about art. You know, when we look in the, in our, the archaeological record, that's like one of those things that came with the uh, the Neolithic cultural revolution one of the things is like very clear evidence of art very clear evidence of music i'll put music in this category too i collect instruments i don't know if you can tell <laughs> i got i have instruments like lay all around my office here um, but i think art and music are both really really important i think they're fundamentally the same kind of thing right just a, a, having a creative expression and a, it gives us another way it's also it taps into like that kind of multimodal experience of the world being able to connect to things in nature in more than one way using more than one sense. I don't know. I think art's really important and meaningful. <laughs> and I think it's like, um, we always say, oh, it's enjoy the process. It, end product is important, but enjoy the process. I feel like art is the thing that is, you can enjoy the process the most sometimes, because sometimes yeah. in science and other more logical fields, the product is as important as the process, but in music or art, the process feels you sometimes. So the pro I mean, the product and art can be important, but I think that the the mindset you want to be in is the mindset of focus on the process, not the product, because you might undermine yourself if you think too much about where it's going rather than how you get there. Yeah. Thank you so much for all, all your input today. Yeah, no um, problem. I'm going to make uh, try to make the most output of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. And I'm giving the... Like, you go. Well, thank you, Professor Rhodes, for the wonderful presentation. From the beginning, I was still thinking about the argument between if AI is actually like us mm -hmm. or if, had, if it has absolutely nothing with us. And then I continue to think about how, you know, ChatGPT generated this brand new language. And I was thinking how it can go from now here on. And that's very, very that was very, very interesting. And there were some couple of points. And one point that I really absolutely loved was how you mentioned, you know, um, there might be a point that we don't know if while we're evolving, if AI can actually like stop, um, you know, not really stop or, or if it will have enough or not enough information. That was very cool. As from the linguistic side, I think I learned a lot today. I think our audience learned a lot today and we are very appreciative of your book, um, book recommendations, book recommendations and thoughts about art. So thank you, Professor, uh, for joining us today for your wonderful sharings. And thank you, Maria, for being a wonderful moderator and asking great questions and i want to thank our audience for tuning in on tonight's etox episode thank you so much for joining everyone uh, make sure to like and subscribe and make sure to check out professor rose youtube channel which will be linked in the description box below and see you in next week <laughs>